Well, Thank good morning and welcome <laughs> um, to. Thanks so much for being here at this rather early hour on a on a Sunday morning. Sunday, I think. Is it Sunday? Yes, I think it's Sunday. Uh, in this hour, finally open venue at Carriage Works, where uh, we explore some of the languages of cinema uh, and how that has been uh, taken up by artists of late and uh, distilled and rearranged into a number of uh, permutations and contemplations. And I'm joined this morning by Magritte and Pearson. Is I'm, I saying your name? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Can you say it? Pearson. 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 And Gabriel, uh, whose work you will see out here in the, the Carriage Works cluster, uh, which as uh, many people have you know, made note already, you know, is, is a cinematic box itself. And I was thinking very much of uh, Roland Barthes, actually, when we were uh, beginning to think about how we might configure this space and, and thinking about his very lovely evocative words about sitting in the dark and uh, uh, the sort of dream uh, space that is evoked by cinema. Uh, it's very interesting to me, I think, that of late, and I said this last night also, that uh, it's taken nearly you know, 120 years or so since cinema was invented uh, for it to have been returned from whence it came uh, somewhat, and that is back to the artist who created it, uh, recognising that, in fact, cinema is made from many, many frames of um, still images that are run together. Uh, and so I, for me it is a, a fascinating uh, deconstruction, if you like, of cinema that we start to see unfolding here. As well as that, we also have this space, which you're sitting in this morning, uh, which is devoted to my longer programme, and uh, this is partly to do with the fact that, uh, as well as the wonderful inventions that we see outside of this room, we are also seeing artists now, with uh, the technology available to them, uh, beginning to make very uh, complex, very beautiful and sometimes uh, longer lengthy uh, investigations of society in, in a documentary style, uh, also longer narratives and inventions such as we see with someone like Norman Leto. And partly this is, I think, to do with uh, the recent availability of a new technology that gives us a almost super image. And what we're seeing, especially in some of these longer works, is a much, uh, a very enhanced, luxurious kind of image making, which re-delivers things such as landscape and portraiture uh, to us. It's almost a history kind of painting. And so I think we're entering into yet another generation of uh, video making, uh, very different from the first gen, which was sort of gritty and uh, momentary. We are now actually uh, looking at narratives with arcs, beginnings, middles and end, which is why I invented this space, because I think uh, we've become accustomed to, in the uh, visual art world, wandering into, meandering through, uh, moving image loops, etc., and uh, you know, finding that we can sort of enter into it at one point and leave it at another point at will. But I think uh, what we're seeing in this space, in, in this particular room, are a group of works that actually really need some kind of uh, concentration and attention uh, and, and some respect, in fact, for the sort of stories that are being unfolded. But this morning we're going to talk about perhaps the more uh, invented worlds that uh, uh, come as a result of the cinematic language uh, and the way in which a couple of our visiting artists have, uh, have made those their worlds as well. Um, when we spoke in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, and you started to show us about your work uh, using this sort of background of, of uh, Bambi, but without Bambi, it was extremely intriguing to me that, uh, in fact, in many viewings of Bambi over many years, I, I, I was actually slightly unaware of the landscape. And yet your, your work brings to the fore the amazing numbers of landscape that are in the work, uh, and on top of which, it also uh, brings to our attention immediately uh, the very long legacy of the animated landscape and its attachment in certain ways to an art historical landscape. I wonder if you would mind talking a little bit about uh, why you did the remastered Bambi and uh, what the purpose of concentrating on the landscape was for you. And please use the microphone. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Um, yeah, it's a long story. We started out with... We, we have time. <laughs> yeah, we have time. We just started out actually yeah. with just liking very much the background of, of Walt Disney's Bambi. As it is made, of course, as you said, so it's, it's um, 
at the time when it was made, it was in 1942, Disney hired uh, lots of people from Europe to uh, paint all the backgrounds. And so the, the, the backgrounds of the Bambi forest was completely embedded in art history. And it had a, uh, and also he created a new technique. It was called the multi-panel, sort of multi-plane technique, where you could see all the coulisses. You could have a, an enormous feeling of depth. And it was for the first time, actually, that uh, yeah, the, the, the film the animation was so like so much like a virtual reality. There was so much depth in there. It was actually the first time that like a realistic, um, a realistic rendering was made of an unreal world because the nature that we actually see reminds of, of, of things, and it's brought us being a realistic sort of idea of a nature. But of course, it is like an it's more like the land of Eden that is promoted in his film. And the thing is that you actually, when you're watching the film, like you say, you don't really feel this. But this is happening so much in imagery, like the power of image. It's actually not so much about what you see. I mean, of course, it's about what you see, but it's actually what the picture, of course, means. So the force, the, the power of the object itself, of the, of the picture itself, and how the sort of, you know, how it sort of ma manipulates you into, like, um, getting some sort of, um, how it, actually, it's a picture is a bit like a magician that you that you that it shows you something and at the same time it doesn't show you the other thing so that's actually what we did we wanted to show what was behind like like that 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 thing that was like in the foreground so what happens what stays if you take away like the subject of something and does it still have that same nar narrative and so we were actually just really curious about what would happen if, if something like that happened and then also, of course, um, sorry that we keep on talking. <laughs> no, 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 it's very <laughs> good for then, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then also, uh, nature is just such a, to quote uh, Levi Strauss, nature is such a good tool to, to think with about ourselves. It's, I mean, nature, it, uh, as Courbet use it, or, or some other painters, uh, you could just depict very political you could just play around with it and make it into a, a world that it can say a lot about other things as well. well of course, I mean, landscape is never, has never actually been divorced away from content. Yeah. I think sometimes people are completely unaware that when they're looking at a landscape, yeah. they're actually looking at a constructed place, that it's a, it's a social place, it is often a political place. Yeah. I mean, we have here in Australia a very strong attachment to a landscape tradition, in especially in our visual artwork, mm -hmm. uh, which is often in the contemporary world denied. You know, it's a, please don't talk about the landscape. We are not the landscape. We are, you know, urbanised sort of space. But of course, you know, this is a rejection in some way of the, the subtlety of the message of nationhood. And so in, in Australia, especially during the mid-war period yeah. between the, the First World War and the Second World War, Landscape here was used very much as a kind of uh, advertisement, if you want, about the way in which mm. uh, Australia was a reliable uh, pastoral resource. Yeah. You yeah. know, and of course this is this goes through all of history, and then when we go back into the 19th century, into the 18th century, and so forth, landscapes are not without their political, social, economic agendas in many ways. It's a it's a, one of those funny things too in um, in Fine Arts 101. You know, they always ask you uh, uh, very early in the piece, the Mona Lisa, is she, is she in front of a landscape or not? Uh, and, you know, it's, um, yeah. this is the background to a whole dimension of wealth and patronage and another kind of history of space uh, that's been created by that. So anyway, we're, we're digressing here. What has been interesting, I think, for many people who've looked at the work, I'm sure, is to, as you say, recognise the, uh, the content is coming through from that pictorialism, that allegoricism that we were sp speaking about yesterday with John Stesica. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's and you know, you mentioned yeah. Courbet, and there he lurks again, uh, as does, I think, in this work also, the work of Caspar David Friedrich yeah. and a number of other people who uh, lurk, at, lurk at the edges of you know, landscape and politics. The Bambi story is interesting, isn't it? Because in its original format, before Disney got a hold of it and, and kind of uh, not beautified it so much, but... Uh, 
tamed it a little bit. Yeah. It was it was much more of a political narrative, was it not? It was it was written in like the 1930s. It was written by an Austrian writer, Felix Salton, and he wrote it actually. Um, he was a Jew himself, and he wrote it, of course, um, as some kind of a. Uh, complain, an allegory for the Nazi regime that at that moment was starting up in Europe. And uh, in his vision, uh, the Bambi story, um, the n nature was a place where Darwinism reigned. So uh, the animals were very violent. They would kill each other. Um, there was no harmony whatsoever. And Bambi, uh, as a shoot, uh, Bambi was alone. That was his main theme. Bambi was alone, uh, the lone hunter, the lone person or the lone animal that should cope with nature uh, only for himself. And Disney disnified it <laughs> and made the, all the animals in a harmonious core of the film. And I think he was a subversive utopian person, Disney, actually. Um, yeah. I'm not even certain it was subversive, but uh, quite deliberate. And th there is a there is a strange kind of thing with Disney where he was um, quietly proceeding toward a, a construct of a society that was um, a little bit like the Garden City, which w is a form of utopian arrangement in Britain, yeah. uh, but with a kind of capitalist <laughs> overlay. I mean, he, he was he was quite a free range thinker. I'm not even certain if it was entirely conscious at certain times, but he often no, he yeah. often drifted to stories that had um, a quite serious kind of dimension of uh, modelling about it. And of course, his his creatures, you know, in Bambi yeah. were that kind of model on the backdrop of something uh, slightly more sinister, actually. In yeah, fact, yeah. Yeah. can you uh, would you mind explaining to us a little bit the process of making the work? Because I'm sure there would be some people here who would like to know. Uh, how elaborate that process was. It was, yeah, very. It took us a yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was actually one of the nicest works to work on while doing it. I mean, um, what of we. In mm -hmm. America. <laughs> yeah, because, um, b because we were actually traveling at that time in uh, California and we were traveling in the forest and we made like stills uh, from the, uh, the Bambi film and we w would look in the forest and to find trees like exactly the same sort of trees that were in Bambi itself. So we were sort of, because it's made with photos, it's not made with drawings. And so we were just like looking in the forest with like some sort of a, a really, a, a, a target. Oh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Double. <laughs> and um, yeah. And um, so we, um, we took uh, those, the, we copied. Actually, what you see in our film is that the beginning, like the first couple of minutes, is an exact copy of Bambi. It starts really the same, so the same trees, the same composition. There's one big difference, though. Where you go in Bambi, into the future, in sort of like the Western way of like getting the future from uh, uh, left to right, so you move like that. In our version, we go back. So we go backwards. And the same thing actually happens with the sound at that moment. The sound also is sort of uh, like played backwards, but then also um, then it's played back again. So it, it's not just played backwards; it's really com uh, com uh, uh, yeah. Well, Maybe composed. I should uh, also explain a bit because it, I, I understand that our technology is quite um, uh, meaningful to the whole process. Uh, yeah. We constructed out of it's a it's a virtual maquette actually with a. All the colises are of like cut out trees, cut out plants, and we place them in a in a maquette, in an architectural maquette behind each other. So it's an endless maquette of yeah, of, mm, yeah. It goes well, on I, and on. I think it's like important also. No, I disagree about how they make it work. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I just wanted to add something because I think it's important. One of the reasons actually to go to Bambi, to think about Bambi, creating Bambi, mastering Bambi was that Bambi was the first virtual world that we could actually enter. And so, I mean, the beautif beautiful, I mean, we live now in a world where the virtual is like, you know, you have like your screen and you can have like, um, you know, two million pictures on like one little screen. So, you know, you could, you can, you can even not even think of the flatness of the depth of, 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 of that little screen. And in Bambi, for the first time, you actually see the construction of this virtual world where now, I mean, you sort of get used to that, but this was the first time that you could actually enter such a world. And the 
sort of the honesty of it because you can really see it's divided in those like in those layers two-dimensional layers so yeah. that's what happens we create like this virtual maquette and then we go through them and yeah and it's good uh point I think to bring Gabrielle into this conversation because of course you have made an actual thing uh, you have taken a kind of moment from cinema uh, a mood shifting moment and you've actualized it as a three-dimensional uh, characterization um, which of course is a frozen moment of a sort it's a it's a it's a, a pivotal moment in a cinematic time it could be sinister, it could be sweet, it could be explosive, it could be all of those sorts of things. And you and I have had uh, very nice conversations over a number of months now about things like mood setting techniques with the gobo and all of this sort of thing. What, what is it about the frozen moment that uh, is compelling to you in, in extracting or distilling uh, cinema? I'm very pleased with <laughs> Um, well, my background is filmmaking, um, so I studied cinema. I, I didn't finish the course, but I, I considered myself a filmmaker before I became an artist. And actually, in the course of being a visual artist, uh, exhibiting in museums, biennials and such, um, I've, I've adopted the idea um, that I'm a filmmaker without a camera. Mm -hmm. And this is not always true, because actually in this, this particular room, we have three of my films that actually are films. Um, but that took a long time. It took actually, I guess, about six or seven years into the fine art world before I actually returned back to actually making cinema. But if you are a filmmaker without a camera, that means that you, you, you find ways to create the cinematic um, through the use of its elements, not necessarily all of it. Now, if you count the elements of cinema, you, you know, without knowing the exact number, but we all know it's photography, it's uh, architecture for the stage, then it's obviously light, sound, composition of music, uh, literature, if you want to call it scenario, literature, theater, and so on and so forth. So actually, if you work with light and maybe a voice, you could already evoke the cinematic, right? You can do also theater, but it's very different. In, in actual fact, there's a different grammar going on and the, and the way people identify with, with cinema. Um, cinema is obviously sim exemplified by the fact that it allows um, a composition that takes place in various times on various locations. You and I talking here, cut Paris uh, airplane lands. Yeah, so it's like a huge collage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's something that in theatre, you know, there's moments in theatre where they do try to establish dual time or, or, or parallel, um, uh, you know, times happening at the, the, at once. But in in fact, uh, cinema allows you this, and so time, um, whether it is a parallel time, things happening at the same time. Um, two narratives, maybe ten narratives, all going towards the same conclusion, which you know, like a Robert Altman movie or something. Um, the, the maybe the maybe the maybe the the end of that is where time stops, where everything is um, uh, not moving anymore, but actually sits there. And and this is one of a couple of pieces that I've made in the past years, where I'm trying to capture um, the idea of a moving image which is the time-based image which you actually experience as if it were a loop or something that has a duration, but actually has no other duration than the time you invest in it. So you are the time added to the image. Yeah. Well, that's very nice. I think that's a, that's, but we don't, we don't get that when cinema rolls. It's only when you extract that moment and you give attention to that mood shift. I mean, this is why the curtains, is it not, are blowing at a, and, but still frozen. So that it's a, a pivotal moment. It's a, it's a, it's almost a punctum uh, sort of moment. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the curtains here, and they are a continuation of a work that I made in 2010. Which, if if that's interesting, I could also elaborate on why and how. Um, but they definitely, they are what you would call in cinema. I mean, the most uh, most well known mood is the thunder strikes and enter evil. Um, but there's many, and and we've we've the been train, the train, the train, the train, oh, the keyhole, yeah. um, the fact that 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 um, that there's a certain shadow suddenly covering a part of the image, um, you know, especially in the Nouvelle Vague, the idea of what happens outside of the frame, mm. you'd hear a scream, but you wouldn't see what was going on. All these things are, and we're very accustomed uh, accustomed to understanding this now, as much as we're very accustomed to understand 
cynicism or sarcasm in language. You know, if you speak a language and you share this language, you understand how it's meant. Mm. So we have the same in cinema. We know at a certain point what is meant if suddenly leaves start dropping or rain hits the pavement or these kind of things. So th this is fascinating. And I do think that I made a piece once in, in memory or in honor or inspired by, um, by Jacques Tati and, and one of his, gen the genius of, of his movies is that they actually do what you said it happens um, only seldomly, they actually throw you back into your self-consciousness as an audience. Um, there's a, the scene I like a lot is where you have these people observing a TV which is in the middle of a house. So the only thing you see is the people in the house observing each other, it <laughs> seems. And this is a moment where you as an audience, if you're in a theater, you're like, oh, I'm sitting here, they're sitting there. So you, 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 as an example of how it does happen on occasion, that the time you, you add as a spectator can also uh, be something you realize when you watch a movie, but it's rare. Yes. Yeah. I, I like uh, also very much this uh, moment of wind that you've created because it lives in so many different places in the cinematic language. And of course it also relates a little bit to the concept of, of the dream entering, uh, which of course you know we, we also make reference to in cinema the, the concept of it being the dream factory. But it's a, 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 a thing that Freud mentioned very much about the thing coming through the window at night, the, the lurking thing or the story or the narrative that leaves the collage uh, that we make in our heads in the unconscious um, hours. And it does really strike me, even though Freud was actually never lured to the cinema, in fact he sort of resisted it quite strongly, uh, being in it or writing for it or, or any such thing, um, he, he did pre pre-announce in a sort of way this idea of cinema being a, a kind of strange, surrealist uh, moment within our kind of unconscious self, this way we arrange things, you know, after the day and the clutter of things, etc. And for me, your wind sort of bring, just brings that in. And so it collects many meanings, and I imagine that's what you mean when the audience comes to this. They perhaps bring with them certain kinds of unconscious thoughts. So it, perhaps you've come in a happy mood, it's a, it's a romantic scene. Perhaps if you come with trepidation or anxiety, maybe it's, you know, uh, the, the wood um, hut that will just about blow up in front of you or some such. Perhaps it's the Unabomber, you know. Uh, it, it's very interesting, too. I, I showed a nice work of Janet Carter from George Boris Miller, who were also in the Spianale uh, some years ago, a little hut in a, a tiny little um, min miniature cinema. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, but of course, the, the hut is such a trope as well in cinema. Almost almost invariably very bad things happen in huts, unless you're having a romantic uh, liaison that you don't want someone to know about. And so it builds this drama, doesn't it, of, of uh, a slightly sinister, um, outcast sort of space as well. But we've centred it. We've put it centrally within the, the schematic uh, here so that you know we've created almost like a, an oasis or a wood around that too. I, I'm quite enjoying the fact that you occupy this middle space, even though it's perhaps the, the place that you would go to within the middle of the narrative somehow. Um, well, I don't know. That's <coughs> that is not the question per se. I, no, I'm I also happy. No, I suppose, <laughs> it's a, I suppose it's a statement anyway. Um, but I, well, I was I was going to say something. Yeah. The interesting thing. I mean, I'm happy it's where it is also, and um, and as you know, and, and people in the audience don't yet, we, we've come a long way because yes, we've it's had some... It's the third some iteration of the idea, yes, it, pretty yeah, much, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, and we can, you know, we can talk about why that would be the case if you want. No, not necessarily. Mostly technical. Exactly. In cinema, like you were saying, there are many different uh, connotations to the wind, and um, but usually the wind is change. It, it, in Western movies, it always predicts change or something's changing. And the other dominant association with, with wind in cinema is seduction. Um, but that could be any seduction. It could be sexual, but it could also be seduction in a religious way. Um, and I think that the juxtaposition or the, the fusion of something that we do think is quite sinister or individual, because the cabin is either where the rider goes, usually something bad happens, I have to agree, um, or where, you know, um, evil lurks or um, in a lot of horror movies, the uh, innocent teenagers end up in uh, a cabin somewhere in a forest. But I think that the, it, although 
all my work, and this one included, is not about trying to tell an audience um, my thoughts that they have to then um, say, oh, he's right or wrong. I want people to come up with their own associations and their own understanding or um, their own um, narrative. Um, I think that what is interesting is that if uh, wind and these curtains, in a way, um, refer to change and seduction combined with something that is quite sinister, I think there's a very interesting... Um, I'm not going to say that as much as the political landscape it is, but in a way it, the language is at least something that I think has an inner conflict, when what I think is interesting in art. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Can I just draw you both in now and um, talk a little bit about the way in which architecture ha has been a common um, linkage here? I mean, because I think it's, com it's very interesting that you talk about that technique, because I think when people look at that they would not assume that it has... Uh, a kind of built reality that, that then translates to a celluloid or digital reality at all. Uh, and then the converse with, you know, Gabrielle. Um, is it therefore a kind of ultra installation that then has a kind of afterlife? Do you see the process as being uh, m many parts? And is it important actually that people understand that? Or for you, once it's, it's actually captured in the digital, it doesn't matter that people are unaware of the, the architectural construct that's happened? I think uh, people are probably subconsciously that they are aware. I mean, uh, it's so... The reason I yeah. ask is because I think, I mean, you know, I'm older than a lot of people here probably, yeah. but I, I do remember watching uh, a number of the Disney programs. We had it here in Australia. Yeah. And every, every fourth week or something, they would actually reveal something of the making of works, which I found very fascinating. So and... Uh, it, it was always very nice to actually see the way in which things were made, yeah. but generally not through sonography, not through built sonography, but through those gels that were painted and then laid upon, then laid upon, etc. I mean, your approach is sort of quite different in that way. Yeah. Do you come from a sculptural practice originally, or is it always the case that you have worked with, you know, um, a, a painting or thing, or is or is it a multiple kind of approach? Um. I don't know if I really understand the question. No, yet. okay. Um, uh, you yeah. could have just painted them. Yeah. But you, but you built them. So it's yeah. the process of building. I think, a like, kind but of we actually, we, we don't have a sculpture background at all. I mean, we actually are more like both. Actually, wh why we started work together, it had to do with like making collage and like getting really interested in from both very different perspectives, though, because Brigitte has some sort of a. Uh, uh, I sort of like. Uh, uh, uh I'm a bit of an invalid, so <laughs> <laughs> I cannot you're really. A what? Invalid. I cannot. Or uh, invalid. invalid. Okay. <laughs> invalid. <laughs> I cannot I mean, see uh, depths. So from. Oh, from you have depths. Depths. Depth, uh, uh, a bit. Uh, a bit oh, really? Slightly. That's and so um, uh, from the from my youth on, I I used to make collage where you would have like some f like John Stessacker yeah. uh, yeah. does so brilliantly. Uh, you would always have the feeling that you would fall into something or that suddenly a gate would be opened in the middle of the picture or um, so I'm really aware of of the distinction between the flat screen and the and the the, the actually the void between each um, coulisse. Because Margit sort of always had to like choose the depth between things because you can really yeah. see it. And I think like for me my sort of interest is much more that I was always like sort of concentrating on the background because I would be really sort of like I didn't want to get manipulated too much with like what was going in the fr on in the front so I was just checking the sides of things. And no, and also actually that <laughs> has to do with what uh, Gabriel told us uh, which I really oh, like very much. You say that very nicely. Uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, okay. that the viewer becomes um, somehow the time machine or the viewer becomes the film itself. Mm. As we uh, take away the the little Bambi uh, yeah. animals, of course the viewer gets you become gets Bambi. You become <laughs> Bambi, and that's what we want. So to, that you that you feel connected much more to the to the screen. Yeah, but w one thing that I would like to say just more about the question you started with mm. is that like we, so we're not sculpture. Mm. Not at all. I mean, actually, I, I really... Have so it's just a means to create. Yeah, but actually what happens is when we are creating like these worlds, 
they are sort of really physical so they become yeah. like within like the 3d world within the computer it becomes like you know when you're playing a game that you're sort of like doing that and then you're going uh, like um you know you, you're you're sort of moving in there and it's like it is like it's not like painting it's really like sculptural mm. sort of work how to get the camera going through like like, like these yeah. layers so it becomes sculptural like mm. the f way of making it i think it, it really is like a, a um, comparable sort and of we like can also um we can make new time and that's very interesting to us so yes, yes. between the coulisses uh, in the end of the movie mastering palm you see big um, black gaps yes. great voids coming into the movie and i think that's a really interesting point i, I mean for us for ourselves at least because then you we really stretch the time between all the coulisses to feel somehow the flatness of the the imagery yes. and to to dive into the void that nature is or that that anything is that that's um that's an illusion yeah so that's interesting you make time and you still time but time is is uh held it's not it's not that it's um stopped it's it's a held moment in some ways but i think that's you know that's really the other thing that's striking me i mean collage is now of course, you know, being spoken about in a number of ways and a number of conversations that we've been holding through the week. Um, obviously, that is intentional because, you know, I do see collage as actually a very potent uh, thing that artists are dealing with in very many different kinds of ways. And I wonder if, in fact, this is because we're, uh, we've become sensitised to the fact that uh, the, the digital environment that we live in these days, the screen environment that we're constantly dealing with, etc., is a very sort of um, flat space, and that we now, artists and all of us, we need now to actually uh, start to elaborate space time again. Yeah. And that the collage does this uh, interesting collision of things and yeah. opens up a space that uh, needs to be recreated. Even the work of um, uh, Soul Archer, which is at the art space. Uh, installation, these very luscious screen works, which are sort of very perfected worlds and uh, mm. sort of empirically very um, intense, with their with their background na narrative that is this rhizomic thing that opens up spaces and splinters information, and takes us on uh, very weird journeys. Is a form of kind of informational collage laid upon something else, yeah. uh, and I think that artists are really they're they're trying to actually um, expand things. Again, w would you would you think that maybe is a, a fair comment? Uh, um, I no, yeah. anyone, anyone. Well, uh, well, just shortly then. But but I think like what happens in this sort of uh, digital domain where we are, we don't have like like there is nothing like time. There doesn't exist gravity. There's no no such these sort of like uh, uh, physical sort of reality. So we sort of have have to. Take make that fly. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were sort of like <laughs> gesturing. So we, I, I think, like sort of like re, uh, re evaluating this, these uh, sort of physical laws and uh, in, 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 in another way in an to make in them sort artwork, of yeah. um, in full bio, to make them palpable. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm just. <laughs> yeah. What so do you think, Gabriel? Yeah. Maybe well, I think about this a lot, and. Um, to make it a bit simple, like I think we all grew up in a time which was mm, exceptionally linear, mm. also the way we went about editing things and cutting up, um, and even maybe the way we approached collage was still. I don't think in the Middle Ages, for instance, the notion of linear time was very, it was very much a nowish thing and a prediction of the future and the past or the way to edit these. Uh, you see that also in art that. Um, things ha like you could have paintings with five moments happening in one image, and then we go into this this period, obviously through, you know, photography, but cinema, where we start to think linear, right? Things happen in a succession in time, and then um, I think what happens now and what is very interesting, what is defining, you know, the the language of of our, you know, of the 21st century, is the simultaneity of things, the fact that that we we are. Like we who, you know, I haven't lived in the Netherlands for a long time, but we come from the Netherlands, and so we are aware of what time it is there right now. But I could also just open up my mobile phone now and go to another uh, moment, which is maybe a recording of something on YouTube. Uh, I, I was very invested in the hip-hop scene, hence the 
hip hop looking suit. Um, <laughs> but I, I was, and I and I started with 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 cutting really physical tapes. So the one, remember those reel to reel tapes that looked like actually like Mickey Mouse. A bit? Yeah, no, I, um, used to, I used to use those. Yeah, yeah. So and we would actually cut. You could really precisely get the, e e e e and then you would cut it with a knife or a splicer or something, and you would run the loop through the room, and it would go, and and that that was when I was fifteen, sixteen, and then I went into sampling when before you know when you could do it three seconds. Now you can do a million hours, but <clears throat> and you would build these times. That was like Dizzy Gillespie in 1952 in a studio in New Orleans playing <laughs> combined with a bass player from a province in Germany that did do 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 do. And this idea of these times coming together to form a new time, this simultaneity, um, I think, you know, the amount of windows we have on our screen when we're on our computers, the fact that we actually have. Yeah, we can look out of our computer, we can look into the computer, and there we could see a number of times happening at once. Well, I think I've expressed what I wanted to say, yeah, but this yeah. is what is creating a, a, a way of thinking. Mm. I mean, this will be deliciously picked up also by um, Janet Carter from George Boris Miller when uh, we reveal their walk down in the rocks in the mid-program because they are collaging time, fiction, fact, spatial plays, etc. It's a very elaborate kind of thing, and I... I, you know, that is interesting when you say about the, the fact that we now have this capacity to look at multiple screens. That, you know, we've desired that. Actually, we've actually told the computer makers, makers that we, we actually have the capacity to deal with, you know, multiple sites and do a range of things in this and, one and space. And reason in multiple yeah. times. We yeah. can actually understand and have a dialogue that that incorporates more than one time as a conscious thing that we can keep track of, actually. Well, yes, I, and, you know, this is why I say in the catalogue, you know, we, we are in this sort of multiplicity of time and, and things go in a multiplicity of directions that don't necessarily wish to collide, but they sometimes meet. Uh, there's no particular zeitgeist at the moment because we're not any longer perhaps confident or even believe in a one thing, but there are many, many things that will come into play. Maybe it generates another zeitgeist later, who knows, but I think we've become suspicious of this sort of uh, monolithic or singularity, as if everybody is the same or something. Does it matter if people haven't seen Bambi, do you think? Um, not really, I think, no. because it's, it's so much about... We always think of, of uh, our uh, virtual world nowadays with all the screens. Yeah. We always think of it as, a, as some kind of a new ornament, because um, it's so flat. We... we we experience the world via our flat screens, and it's all connected. It's like a giant pattern that's <laughs> laid in front of our eyes. And um, of course, we, we want to suspend, we want to go beyond that pattern. And since uh, ornament after Adolf Loos is... <laughs> Thank uh, you, and that of course refers yeah. naturally to Matthias, who is next to us here. Yeah, and the way in which you know we now realise that little cinema bubble, three and a half or so minutes long, yeah. has such a, a an elaborate amount of decorative elements, skill yeah. making. I mean, it's a hugely decadent project. Yeah. You know, a full orchestra. You know, all of this yeah. sort of stage making, all of this costuming, all of this lighting for this apparently mass entertainment that. I suspect could only now be made in the art world, you know, because no one would tolerate uh, the extent to which that is resource sucking, um, you know, skills needing, all of those things that we haven't got time for anymore. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's, uh, of course, part of the reason why the art world is, you know, becoming quite fascinated now in revisiting some of these things. We give more time to it. And, of course, we don't mm -hmm. expect, you know, the masses necessarily to always come to it uh, and to unpick those sort of decadences or whatever. But, you know, it's a very good example of what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah, completely. <laughs> I'm yeah. compelled to now say that, uh, what is the question? Um, so, uh, I, w in the last few minutes, uh, would open it to the floor if there are any questions that you uh, would like to ask any of the artists. Yeah, Beatrice. I don't Oh, she's got a microphone, <laughs> but no question. Mm -hmm. No, you're you're very content with what you've heard. Yes, up the RC. Ah, yes, John, good on you, mate. <laughs> John Stezzer, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. 
<coughs> Pardon me, I just clear, clear my throat. Um, it's just actually more, less a question, more an observation. I just couldn't help but quote Merleau Ponty at this point. Because Merleau Ponty said something really wonderful, which seemed very. The, 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 for the people who perhaps don't yeah. have phenomenological can, can you, yeah. thinker, yeah. yeah. I was really struck when I was listening to, to you talk earlier, especially what Margaret was saying about the layering and mm. the lack of depth and so on. Um, I just wanted to simply to quote something, if I can remember it, for it's from, from Merleau Ponty's. Um, phenomenology of perception but he was talking about cinema and photography and he says that art is depth in art is not achieved through the automatic laws of perspective and I think he'd extend this to the digital age if you were alive now but it's, it's actually in a struggle against that and in a sense you achieve depth through a kind of struggle against that transparency of the image is a strange kind of opacity and I think all the works of all three of you, in a way, embody that struggle against the transparency of the cinematic image, a kind of arrest of that image in order to contemplate depth. And in a sense, this is part of Merleau-Ponty's um, <clears throat> struggle in life, was to, to try and um, achieve depth against the loss of depth that he saw occurring in the culture around him especially through the technological image. Yeah. Is this something also that is important in your work? Yeah, John? of course. Yeah. Uh, which of you have not yet seen it, it's at the MCA, these wonderful works of John Stesley. <coughs> but, you know, when we were speaking yesterday, uh, I think we, we were touching a little bit on this, but we didn't perhaps, you know, elaborate it needs these other conversations to bring these things out. But, you know, that strikes me as a very uh, clear reference to what you're doing with your collisions, yeah. Which, of course, is why I'm quoting it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> to bring attention. No, no. <laughs> um, there was somebody else near you, I think, uh, who had a question. Yes, up the top there. Um, I, I was interested, Gabrielle, in, in your, in, or in fact, everybody, this um, discussion about time and um, uh, the, I guess, um, in the digital age, you've, you've talked about how many aspects can be controlled um, by the, you know, there's the fast forward button is in virtually all of our, all aspects of the digital that we engage with, um, except for our own uh, mortality. And these, the point that you've got, Gabrielle, of that kind of that nanosecond before the action, um, is this interesting point of we, we could wait there for all of our lives and the action would never happen. Um, I, I was wondering if you'd, if you'd be able to talk about, perhaps about mortality. No, it's... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Little uh, pick, do you know. Pick, pick, picking up on Gertrude no. Stein's no, you know, no, last like, answer. I'm going, yeah. I'm not going to give you... I'm not, I don't, I, I hope you're going to be satisfied with the answer uh, because uh, uh, earlier I mentioned I, was, I could speak about where the origins of the piece uh, are from and it's the following story actually. Um, uh, on New, Year, New Year's Eve, a very good friend of mine and um, at the time artist but also professor of philosophy at the Galatasaray uh, Academy in Istanbul, uh, Hussein Bari Alptekin, a Turkish artist, uh, died um, on New Year's Day actually. And I, I, I don't know, the, the year it started, I flew to Istanbul and we, we um, buried him with a, a number of friends. And then um, one of his best friends is the current director of SALT, which is an art institute in, um, in uh, Istanbul. And he invited me to, to produce an artwork for the inaugural exhibition in memory of Hussein uh, and his work. And um, in my culture, which is I'm Jewish, um, but I'm, I also know in other cultures there are similar uh, traditions, um, when somebody dies and you're in the house with the deceased, you open all the windows to let the soul out. So it's a, you know, you would imagine the soul could travel through the walls, but I think it's also, I mean, when people die, and for those who have experienced this, um, it's very, it's a very good thing for rituals and rules to be there because it, it kind of gives you a feeling that you know you're doing the right thing. You know, not necessarily religiously, but just we opened the windows, we... We we did uh, we washed our hands and certain things. So this is when I came up with the idea of the the curtains uh, hardened. So the the image you you know in the catalog or in some of the press is actually that work in Istanbul, and is actually um, it's trying to communicate or trying to illustrate this idea of the soul. Um, you know, 
living, living life going up to the heavens, something like that. So I don't know, it's not a direct answer to your question on mortality, but the interesting thing I thought is that in fact the peace comes from, from exactly that kind of desire to, to think about uh, you know, uh, earth, heaven, and the transition, or what's it, transcending between, yeah. yeah. So it's a transcendent punctum. It, it was, definitely. It's different here. But in, in Istanbul, this is what it, what it was. Mm. Yes, here. Yeah. Oh, there. OK, sorry, sir. Sorry. But Nisa decided oh. against you. Uh, microphone, a microphone wars, yeah. A question for Persan and Mugget. Something I've, I couldn't, didn't quite understand in far less existential, so sorry about the contrast in question, but with your process, you referred to the architecture of layering uh, the different elements of your landscape. And I couldn't understand uh, when Persan was talking about the, the camera traveling between these layers and Market was talking about the, this uh, physical structure. Do you actually build uh, a, a box with these images or is that within the computer program making that virtual box? I didn't quite understand. Yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's a virtual maquette. So... But we build it in the computer, that's true. But it's, I mean, it's the same, obviously, because we cut out all the trees. It's in the computer, but, but it's it somehow the same process. But it feels real to us. When we are making it, actually, yeah. what happens is that um, you, you sort of, uh, we dream about it. So we sort of um, are really in that landscape. So it becomes a real thing, but it is not there. But we know how it's built and we know. So we know so the. It's, it's there. We know the path. I mean, so there's every tree, every single thing is, is going to be planted somewhere. And, and what is actually nice, if you look at that virtual uh, model and you take a couple of steps back. So as, as you would do as like a photographer and you're sort of like framing your news and then you take a couple of steps back and then you sort of really see the real picture of it. And so when we do that with our virtual maquette, you can see the, suddenly see all the frames of all the pictures and like like suddenly like the trees are cut up in weird ways and you get like completely different sort of uh, uh, well, I, I, I want to help you a bit because <laughs> you guys <laughs> know your process too well and I also found it very difficult but I, I know yeah. I think for the audience although I haven't made it imagine this table has a postcard after a postcard after a postcard it's, with it's cutouts like and you have a scenario. camera flying yeah. through it yeah. And that's your virtual world. Yeah, but that's yeah. not so easy to understand. No, if you I, I, if you it's, that's so it's actually a, a succession of images in a, in a three-dimensional world yeah. that the camera, a three-dimensional camera travels. Or through. like yeah. a coulisses, a coulisses <laughs> in a theater. <laughs> it's the same. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a device they've used for many, many centuries, actually, to layer space, to create per per perspectival state, space. Um, and was especially uh, popular in the Enlightenment and then forward, uh, so that people could actually create sort of plays of space. Uh, and Fiona Hall, many, many years ago, actually made such a nice work that showed that uh, thing. It's like miniature theatre, uh, very sort of beautiful, like a like a sort of photo box almost. Tunnel yeah. box. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I basically came through this place very quickly because so I've only just caught elements of the work but I've got a sensation there of a level of anxiety on the part of me just wandering through that suspended Excellent. moment of the window that the wind is being held and both in also the absence of Bambi, Bambi and the reference to the original writer, the Austrian writer I was wondering what part that anxious theatrical space played in your, both your works or, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I um, anxious theatrical space. I, I I do understand you, and so it's not like I I think oh where that does where does that come from? Um, I think these things are very close to each other. For me, the um, and I liked when when Persine said this. In fact, that there's you know when you think of magic, there's the there's the trick. And then there's the construction, and, and, and what I think he was trying to say is that instead of showing Bambi the trick, you know, they're trying to, to look at the construction of that magic, in fact. And, um, and I, I think that people do uh, experience um, a, a wide variety of 
associations with magic. So some people find it, and you know, there's a lot of people that find it extremely annoying that they don't know how it was done. You know, if you have a little magic trick, people go like, show it again. You know, I gotta find out. So, but there's other people that. So, so, so I think uh, anxiety is one of these things that you are that people might experience in in relation to. Uh, an illusion and its construction because in a way it does also ask you you know to what degree is the world that I believe actually a construction or is it a fiction and I think there's a vertigo or there could be a vertigo I think the, the quote of the biennial you imagine what you desire uh, there's also a um, Schopenhauer has a similar thing the, the, the German philosopher where you you you, you understand the world um, as you imagine it and desire it. That's actually the same thing. <laughs> but yeah, it is Die Welt das Wille und Vorstellung in, in German. <laughs> and I think that this is an existential problem, right? To understand that I that part of what you are experiencing is, is the illusion, the belief, the construction that you are experiencing as something real. That's, I don't know if it answers your question. But yeah, but and yeah. then at the same time, you, you make an encounter with yourself. It becomes your self-consciousness that's uh, looking at the artwork again. Because if you enter this kind of void between illusion and reality, you you take a look back upon yourself. So that's why we started it, at least. I don't know if this is an answer. I think we have time for one question more, if there is another one. No? Uh, if not, then uh, I'm conscious also of the time. We have another couple of talks, which Nisa will mention to you. And of course, we have some other talks happening uh, later in the day at the Art Gallery of New South Wales also. A very busy talks program. Uh, I think this has been a wonderful discussion and we've touched on a number of things that are uh, dear to my heart and, and embedded in the aesthetic journey I wanted to create. So I want to thank you, uh, three of you, for uh, participating in that and the audience too for the nice questions. But can you please thank uh, my guests? And I'm sure that you're anxious to go and see the works now loaded with some more information. But Nisa's got some... Uh, and, and thank you also to Juliana for her time. Oh, no, no, no. That's my job. <laughs> and um, for those of you that are interested in seeing the artist talks, we're starting with Hadley and Maxwell in about 10 minutes, which is the first um, space as you, as you enter the exhibition. Okay, thanks. <laughs>